In a previous video, we saw how to use Retrofit to parse a JSON stream into some Java objects so that we can see those objects inside of our application and then we can emit them with this endpoint we have here, where the endpoint is plants and then we can have a search term and that search term filters down the list of plants that we will get back. Now one thing that we got for free here, if we take a look at this URL, plants endpoint and then search term equals tulip, we'll see that it matches up with this plant endpoints in our controller and indeed there is the search term that it's looking for in the URL. Take a look at our top navigation that has the search box and if we look at that we see that it's going to the plants endpoint and what is the name it's using for the search box? Search term, which should look familiar because it's the same search term name that we're using when we hit this endpoint directly. In other words, this search box, if I type in the word oak and hit search, look at what we get in return, we get that exact same JSON stream in return. So you see that we can do the search by creating this URL directly or our search box and our Navigation is already wired up to use that same endpoint. So we see here Paul Paul, or if I put in Paul, I get Kangaroo Paul and I get Paul Paul. So that works for us. But one thing though, when I do search using this top search box, the results I get back are JSON results, which aren't necessarily user friendly. So in this exercise, what we're going to do is instead of getting back JSON results, we're going to use Bootstrap and Timeleaf to create a nice table that the user can use and the table will have clickable rows so that we can click and we can go to more detail. Now at this point we don't have a detail page just yet so I'm simply going to navigate to that plants record on plantplaces.com but nonetheless it does give us the proof of concept where we can have multiple rows returned, we can show those rows to the user, and we can make those rows visible. So let's take a look at our controller. I want to preserve the endpoint that we've already made that returns JSON, and it uses a response entity to do that. However, I need a slightly different return if I'm going to show it in HTML. Instead of returning JSON, I need to return the objects to HTML. So I will duplicate this endpoint, because again, I want to keep the behavior that already exists. And I'm going to call the pasted version simply search plants form. Now you notice I have two different methods that are assigned to the same endpoint, and that wouldn't work if I left it as it is. So I need to add a qualifier to one or both of them so that we can direct traffic to the appropriate endpoint. This is the one that I'm going to keep just for JSON in, JSON out. Uh, and this is the one that I'm going to use for our HTML view. So let's go up above and remember a previous mapping we did, this post mapping, where we specified for our endpoint that we're going to consume JSON and we're going to produce JSON. We can borrow a bit of this. First of all, note that if we have more than one name value pair in our annotation, that we can no longer assume the default value provided as the endpoint. We have to give it the name value. So we'll say git mapping value equals plants, and now that allows us to specify more qualifiers. And then consumes application JSON, produces application JSON. Great, so we keep that as it were, and now this new mapping here is going to be for our HTML form. We're still going to want to call specimen service.fetch plants and get a list of plants back, but we want to return those plants in a way that our HTML field can look at it. So if we scroll up to the top and look at our default endpoint, we see that it uses a, a different method signature. Instead of returning response entity, it's returning string. And it's accepting a parameter of type model. And for model, we can add any objects that we want to pass to the HTML. So let's use that to reconfigure our method a bit. So return string. And then we'll say search term, comma, model, model. I'll do a little bit of cleanup here. And we will return to this, we'll return the name of an HTML page which we're going to make, which we haven't made yet. Uh, we'll simply call it plant list. 
Or I could even just call it plants. That'll, that'll work. Okay, don't need headers, but we do need to add the plants to our model. So let's say model dot add attribute and note that there are two different signatures for this. One takes a name and a value, the other simply takes a value. Let's give it a name and a value. We'll say all plants and then plants. Or actually, you know what? Let's make it easy. Let's just call it, let's call the name plants and the value plants. We'll make those two one and the same. And then simply return plants. Now we have the return path taken care of if everything goes well, but we get a red line here because we don't have the return taken care of if something went wrong. Since I took away that response entity, we'll simply say return error in this case, and let's put that in quotes, and that means that we need to make an error HTML page. So let's make those pages. I'll navigate to our project and then we'll go to templates, and we already have start and sustainability, which are couple of pages that are fairly basic and we can borrow. So let me choose sustainability and we'll choose copy and templates and control V and we'll call this one error.html and go ahead and add that one. And then we'll create our new, uh, we'll, uh, sorry, we'll paste one more time and we'll call this one plants.html. So for the error page, we'll make this as simple as possible and say something went wrong. For the plants page, we'll say a list of plants. Now, this is just a stub right now. The idea is we'll see a list of plants. We can click on that list, and from that we can see specimens that belong to plants. Because remember that we have a one-to-many relationship between plants and specimens. That's much future feature work. This is getting us set up. I just want to give you the vision of where we're going with this. I've started the application so that we can verify that we get the behavior we expect so far, and that is that new plant page we just made should appear when I hit search. We're not going to see any results just yet because we haven't put the results up here, but we do see that we are indeed hitting the correct new endpoint. It's returning to us the plants HTML page, and that's what we see rendered here, and it's using the TH fragment we described earlier to bring in this universal navigation so that we have a good look and feel. So the page renders now. Now we simply need to show the relevant plants. This is where both Timeleaf and Bootstrap come in. First of all, let's recall that we're getting our collection of plants and we're returning it associated with the name plants. That'll be important in just a moment. Now let's go back to our HTML page, make a bit of room, and we are already importing all of the bootstrap stuff, which is great. So we can reuse that and we're importing the Timely library. Those are things that we got by copy and pasting our sustainability page. So we put those in in a previous video. I'll point you to GitHub if you want to see the exact syntax of this. Now, under a list of plants, we want to iterate over that collection of plants that's provided to us by the controller. And we can do this by using the normal old HTML div tag, but with a couple of special attributes that are provided by both Bootstrap and Timeleaf. So first of all, let's say div class equals list dash group and fix the quotes there a little bit. List dash group is a Bootstrap type. Now we'll say th colon each. And what that means is it's a Timeleaf tag that says iterate over this collection. Now the syntax here is kind of interesting. We'll say double quote and then plant colon dollar sign curly plants. This probably looks a little bit like an iteration that you would have in something like a for each loop in Java or Kotlin or C Sharp, where we essentially have a collection here which is plants. And let's remember that's the same as plants that we see here that we're passing to our HTML page. And it should be because those two things are one and the same. So we're iterating over the collection plants. Each time we iterate, we're shaking hands with another item in that collection. And we put that here in a new variable that we've de defined called plant. Note no dollar sign on this side, but we do have a dollar sign and a curly on this side to indicate that we are retrieving this plant collection from the endpoint that we've called. Now inside of this, we can make an a tag. So let's say a href equals, and we'll just put in pound for the moment, which means the current page. We'll go back and update this in a moment. Then we'll say class equals. And once again, for class, it's a little bit tricky because we're not talking about a Java class. Instead, we're talking about a CSS class. 
And these are mostly the ones that we're using from Bootstrap. So we'll say list dash group dash item space list dash group dash item dash action. So in the land of CSS, you can have multiple classes and they can be separated or delimited by spaces, not by commas, but by spaces. Open curly and then close curly underneath that. And now we need to put some text in this link. So I'm going to say PTH colon text, another one of our time leaf tags to reach into an object and get some stuff out of it. And now double quote, close double quote, dollar sign curly, plant, singular plant, and then we're going to terminate this tag. Now pay special attention, note it's singular plant, not plural plant. That's because this variable here is matching up to this iteration variable here. These two things are one and the same. Note we don't, we just have the word plant here, but down here where we are referring to the iteration variable, it's dollar sign curly and then the word plant and then close curly. I've restarted the application so that we can see what we have so far. I type in red button and hit enter and I'm pretty happy with this because we see that we do have a list here and indeed they're all red buds. Look, every one of these plants is a red bud. I can swear I can change to Paul as in Paul Paul and we'll see that we have common Paul Paul here as well as a few other plants that have that word Paul. I can put an oak, we get our oak trees. So we see that this works, it's also very snappy. Now you might wonder though, what are we seeing here? What did this come from? When the Java Virtual Machine needs to make a string out of an object, it will invoke a toString method. This is defined on the Grand Adam and Eve superclass of all objects. So if we look at the official documentation, you'll see that toString returns a string representation of an object, and that's declared all the way up here on class object, which is the superclass from which all classes inherit. The default implementation is not very helpful. It's the fully qualified class name, which in other words is the package name dot class name, then an at symbol. Then we take the hash code of this object, convert it to hex, and it ends up with something that really doesn't make a whole lot of sense to an average user. Lombok overrides that if we want, and it gives us the class and then a name value pair combination of all of the attributes of that class. So maybe this works for us, or maybe we can make something a, a bit more specific to our case, which we will do. But one thing I wanted to point out is look at the plant ID. So let's take this one, Hydrangea quercifolia, and notice that's plant ID 325. Let's go to plant places, and let's search on something like the Eastern Redbud and get our Eastern Redbud. And you'll see up here, we have a plant ID equals 83, which represents our Eastern Redbud. What if we were to switch that to 325? So let me just do a little tidying up here and we'll make it 325. And if we take a look, what do we have? But we have the Hydrangea quercifolia also known as the oak leaf hydrangea, as you see here. So you see that that number, the plant ID, is actually a unique identifier that identifies that plant on plantplaces.com as well as anywhere else. So we could make a URL out of, out of that ID, couldn't we? And actually, I can even take off this filter equals plant, and we can make it a nice, concise URL. So we'll take this, boom, hit enter, and you notice we still come to the same page the oak leaf hydrangea. So let's remember this URL. I'm going to go ahead and plug it in this ahref just as it is with that plant ID hard coded. But we know we can come back and we can make that a variable. We'll save that for just a moment. Meanwhile, I did want to pick up on another thought that I had, which is let's go into that plant and let's create our own two string annotation. Public string two string. And then we can simply return, let's say, genus plus boom boom, plus species plus boom boom, give us a little bit of space, plus cultivar, plus boom boom, plus ID. I've restarted the application so we can look at the process so far. Let's search for Apple. Notice that the look and feel is a bit different. It has genus, species, and then in some cases, 
genus, species, and cultivar. We should probably add common name in there as well. Nonetheless, you see after that it has the plant ID, which the user doesn't necessarily have to see, but I did want to leave it in there for our demonstration. So I click on this and we know it currently is going to a hard-coded URL, but when I click, does it take us there? Sure enough, it does take us there. It takes us to the oak leaf hydrangea, and indeed every one of these will take us to the oak leaf hydrangea, which leaves us just one more thing to do, and that is let's take this plant ID and let's put it up here in this URL when that is clicked. So for the rest of this, we can simply take a look at our plants page. And the ahref here is what we need to change a little bit. Now, I want to use a bit of time leaf magic, so I'm going to change the URL a little bit. I'm going to start with at symbol open curly, which means this is going to be a time leaf variable. And then we'll close this with a close curly. Now, the plant ID here is a get parameter, in other words, a name value pair that's in the URL. We can handle this, but it's going to be a kind of funny syntax, so bear with me for just a moment. First of all, we'll take off the question mark. That indicates that the name value pairs are coming. We'll start with an open paren and then close paren. And trust me on this one, anytime you do an open, do a close, because we're going to see a lot of symbols here, and we want to keep them separate. Plant ID, we can keep static, because that name is always going to be the same but the value is what's going to differ. The value is not always going to be 325. Instead, we want to use a variable for that. And what variable do we want to use? Well, remember, this is a loop. We're looping over our collection of plants, and each individual plant is going to be represented by this plant variable. So after the equal sign, we can put dollar sign open curly, close curly. And then inside of that, we can say plant, and then using ognal syntax or object graph notation language syntax, we can refer to one of the attributes of our plant object. Let's go back and look at the plant class, and we see there's one here called ID. And sure enough, ID is the one that we want. So ognal syntax says we simply say plant.id, and then it will figure out to call a getter or setter as necessary, and it will be able to retrieve that plant's unique ID value, and then plug it right in here in this URL. One thing I'll mention before I restart is look very carefully at your at symbols, your dollar signs, and also the open close curlies, because they get a bit nested, and when you look at them all together, it can get a bit confusing. So take just a moment, make sure that each of your open curlies and open parens has a corresponding closed curly or closed paren. One other very important thing I need to do is tell Timeleaf to parse this href attribute. Basically, Timeleaf will parse this, make it look like a real HTML href, and to do that, it has to sub out our parameters, so on and so forth. But the only way it knows to do that is if we add this th prefix. Now let's take a look and see if it works. I'll search on Ivy this time, and notice that we get, well, there, it's the Latin name, but nonetheless, these are plants that have the word Ivy in it. Let's click on Acer Sisyphilium. And to verify that our link did work, we notice that we have the ID here. Notice it's Ivy Leaf, Ivy Leaf Maple, Acer Sisyphilium, and we have a unique Ivy Leaf Maple here. Go back and try another one. We'll try Plectranthus 696, and sure enough, you see 696 here appears in the URL, and Plectranthus is the plant that we're looking at. If I go back and do a control U, we can see that each of these URLs has generated with an ID that represents the plant. So, in this video, we've seen how to use the TH each attribute to iterate over a list of plants, and we've also seen how to combine that with a bit of CSS styling with Bootstrap to give our application a nice look and feel. I hope this video has been helpful, and I look forward to reading your comments. Thank you.